Well, it's my pleasure to be with you again uh, to share with you this time on the theme of trees. And I think probably by this point and in the weeks to come, we're going to hear a lot about trees and roots and stumps and stems and uh, saplings and all sorts of things that relate to our faith. But today I want to talk about the mighty oak tree. Okay, from, that's going to be from Isaiah chapter 61. Okay, so let, why don't we read together? Isaiah 61 verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison doors to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them beautiful headdresses instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall rise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Now, this passage probably sounds familiar to many because this is the passage that Jesus read from in his hometown uh, when he uh, was called on to speak. And when he did, uh, he said this very thing, that today this passage is fulfilled in your presence. So that got him pretty much chased out of town. But the point is that this is a prophecy given to the people of Israel hundreds of years before Jesus Christ came. Uh, the prophet Isaiah, he ministered uh, during the, the reign of several kings from Uzziah up to Hezekiah, and many believe that he died during the reign of Manasseh. And this was just shortly before Babylon came in and took them to exile. So he actually ministered to both Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom. Uh, and both of them uh, were not where they should have been with the Lord, right? So ever since the Exodus and actually coming into the land, Israel constantly struggled with idolatry, with looking to the people of the land and their ways and their culture and even their gods. Uh, and they worshipped those gods rather than the God who had delivered them from slavery in Egypt. And at this point in Israel's history, this is getting to the end, and Isaiah spends the first half of his book warning the people of Israel, the people of Judah, and even the surrounding nations of God's coming judgment on sin because of their unfaithfulness. And then, interestingly enough, the last 27 chapters of the book are words of comfort and words of hope given to Israel that though they will be cast out of the land and taken into exile, they will be judged. In the end, they will be comforted that God will establish his kingdom once again in Israel. So to, the fact that Jesus read this passage, right, uh, it shows that the kingdom of God is established through Jesus Christ. And so therefore, we as Believers in Jesus Christ are partakers of that promise that was given to the people of Israel long ago, that instead of ashes, they will have beauty, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. God has always desired a people that would walk faithfully with him so that he can show his greatness to the world and draw many to himself. And so the church can actually walk in the fulfillment of this prophecy. <clears throat> so why oak trees? Now, um, the word that's used there, the Hebrew word that's used there for the oak tree is actually just the word for strength. It comes from the same root as the word for strength. Now, it's, been, it's used of rams, it's used of other strong things, but in this case, it's a planting. And really, what is stronger than the oak tree? The oak tree is known it's as an enduring, strong, lasting tree, right? In fact, 
Uh, the oak tree can live for hundreds of years, up to 200 years. I mean, it grows tall, and in a deciduous forest, it really has a presence. It, it uh, provides uh, a place for animals to live and food within that ecosystem. It can actually store water in its larger, um, its larger branches so that it would help to survive during dry periods. Of course, its roots go deep into the earth and it grows tall, so it becomes a massive presence in the forest. Even their seed uh, is, is built to last. You know, the, the acorn has a hard shell, but inside has all the nutrients that a new sapling would need once it starts to sprout. So the oak tree is built for survival. It is built to persevere. And that's really what the picture is here, is that uh, the oak tree is a picture of perseverance. Perseverance of the saints and also the prevailing of the church. And that's really what I'd like to share this morning. So the oak tree is a symbol of the persevering saint. Now, perseverance is, uh, as a word, means endurance, resolve, tenacity. It's the idea of standing firm and even moving forward in the face of difficulty or any circumstance. Uh, it's what God's people are in great need of these days, especially with all that's happening in the world uh, and, and even in our city. We need uh, perseverance. We need, uh, we need to endure in every situation. You know, it sounds like um, Again, what we are feeling right now in Hong Kong with all of the uncertainty and around the world with all of the uncertainty and the volatility and the ambiguity, right, uh, and the complexity that we have in the world. Uh, you know, experts call this a VUCA world. So the perseverance of the saints is actually a theological concept, right? And it has lots of nuances, and depending where you fall and what systems you follow, it may mean slightly different things. But... Simply put, the perseverance of the saints is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the true believer that empowers the believer to overcome and endure faithfully until the end, until Christ comes or we see him, right, until we're raised with him. So how do we remain faithful to the end uh, when our faith is really, it's constantly under attack? right? Externally from the enemy of our souls, the adversary who's constantly bringing deception and condemnation, who is attacking our faith and trying to uh, call God's word into question more and more every day. Uh, a world culture that, that actually suppresses the truth uh, in favor of its own wisdom, or even our own internal battles with our sinful nature. Um, how do we remain faithful? How has the church remained faithful and endured for 2,000 years? Well, the oak tree uh, is a great example of this because it is sustained under all sorts of circumstances. In fact, uh, it is created and is adapted in such a way that even its, even its bark, its thick bark, protects it from fire. Uh, and, and it has uh, tannic acid in it, which actually acts as a pesticide and, and, a, and a fungicide, right, that keeps it safe from uh, fungal infections and from, uh, from invasive insects. So the oak is a great example of how to defend uh, and how to endure under all circumstances. So uh, in a similar way, we are a new creation, right? that have been endowed, we've been similarly endowed with supernatural defenses, just like the oak. Uh, perseverance, uh, says Eugene Peterson, a uh, pastor and author, is not the result of our determination. It is the result of God's faithfulness. You know, when it comes to perseverance, there is a meeting of God's faithfulness and power with our faith. And uh, we need to activate God's faithfulness by believing and trusting in what he says rather than what our own, maybe our, even our own conscience is saying or what the enemy is speaking or what the world is speaking. We need to believe God. So the first defense that we have is a renewed, a renewed mind that is shaped by God's word, like deep roots anchoring us in place. Romans 12, 1 to 2 says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. 
Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, there are so many voices in the world, and it can be confusing if we try to listen to them all. Like, everybody literally has a stage these days with social networking, and uh, anybody, can, anybody can say whatever they want. And if we are not rooted in God's Word, it's easy to get confused. It's easy to get off track. But if we do allow our minds to be renewed by God's Word, we will know what is good and acceptable and perfect, His will. So God gave us these wonderful senses, right? We have sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. They help us to navigate the physical universe, the world around us, and they do help us. But when we rely on just our senses um, to guide our lives, then we can easily be deceived. We can easily fall in deception, into deception. Uh, God's word is that eternal revelation of who God is, what his will is, uh, and what is, it, what is good, acceptable, and perfect, so that we will have wisdom for living a supernatural life guided by the Holy Spirit. So our first defense is God's word itself. Now, the enemy can use our senses to entice us, like he did to Eve, uh, to either be ignorant of or in doubt of God's wisdom and goodness. So that wisdom is worldly wisdom, and it's sensual, it's earthly, it's demonic, according to James 3.15. And unfortunately, it seems to align much better to our own experiences and senses. You know, when it comes down to us, this is why uh, before we are awakened, before we are regenerated, before God gets a hold of our hearts and minds, that's why we just go with the flow of the world because it makes so much sense to live for our own pleasures, to, to pluck that low-hanging fruit that just meets our felt needs. But we're not, we don't want to be living that way anymore. We're, we're taught to put that aside and to put on Christ, right? So what the enemy does, he tries to tempt us with maybe the fear of missing out, FOMO, right? A fear of an uncertain future. Um, our desire for comfort, security, and pleasure. Uh, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that view that we are in control, or should be, and that we should have the ultimate say in our own lives. And that all feels very good to the natural mind, but it, it's contradictory to the life of discipleship and a life that will remain, right, that will persevere. Psalm 1, 1 to 3 says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither, and all he does prospers. So this sounds like what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, that everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. So in addition to having God's word and a renewed mind, he's also given us spiritual weapons. So like the oak tree has that bark with a tannic acid that, and that protects it from fire and pest, we also have uh, weapons, defensive weapons in our arsenal. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3-5 to five says that we walk, though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but, are, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And Ephesians 6, 12 to 13 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And those weapons are, of course, the helmet of salvation. Our sins are forgiven. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We have the hope of eternal salvation. We have the belt of truth that we've already discussed, God's word, that sword of the Spirit, His righteousness that covers us, and the shield of faith that we can put our trust in Him in every situation. And of course, 
we have the powerful weapon of prayer and we can pray for one another, we can pray for ourselves, and even Jesus himself makes intercession for us. So we are well equipped to battle both the internal enemies, these strongholds, and the external enemies, the enemy of our soul. So in addition to those spiritual weapons and the Word of God, we have an eternal perspective and a living hope in the midst of trials. So we've already said that an oak tree lives hundreds of years, right? Um, we have a long-term perspective. So we know uh, 1 Peter 1, 3 says, chapter 1, verse 3 says, that uh, our blessed God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are by God's power being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, this does not come under, un, um, uncontended, right? This inheritance that we have, it's a sure gift of God. But, and we rejoice in it, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, you know, a faith untested is... Um, is untested. A faith untested uh, is unknown, right? Uh, Rick Warren says this, that the ultimate test of faith is not how loudly you praise God in happy times, but how deeply you trust Him in dark times. And Colossians 1, 22 to 23 says this, He is now reconciled in the body of His flesh by His death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him, if indeed you continue in faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So our faith will be tested, and we need to hold firm. And we can hold firm because of the last promise, this last weapon that we have, that we have been given the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So just as the oak tree is nourished by the sun, rain, and soil, we are nourished by the very presence of God himself in our life. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14 says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we actually require or acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Do you see that theme continuing? All of this is to the glory of God, right? Oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He might be glorified. Our perseverance, our continuation, our continued faithfulness, even in difficulty, results in the glory of God, and it is a testimony to the world. Okay? God has given us a renewed mind. He has given us spiritual weapons. He has given us a long-suffering hope right, and a life to come that pales this life, and He's given us His very presence. So God's part uh, is to provide everything for us. Everything that pertains to life and godliness is given. Our part is to appropriate by faith all that He has given, to nurture the kind of wholehearted relationship with God, the thinking, disciplines, and actions that keep us deeply rooted in Christ and His provision. And it's important to note, it's not our effort. Again, this is a meeting of everything that God has done and us accessing that by faith into our own lives. So, but what we need to be careful of is the same kind of earthbound thinking and longing that kept Israel from being the light that God intended them to be in their generation, right? Uh, they grabbed that low-hanging fruit that the enemy wanted to give. 
the idolatry and the things for the pleasures and the temporary pleasures of this, of this earth um, instead of clinging to God and the living water that he wanted to give them. They gave into idolatry and adultery and, and, uh, and a religion that they could control when God wanted to give them a kingdom. So what kind of oak tree are we going to be? In Isaiah 1, 30 to 31, there's another oak tree. Uh, and, and it related to backslidden Israel. For you shall be like an oak whose leaf withers and like a garden without water. And the strong shall become tender and his work a spark. And both of them shall burn together with none to quench them. So the oak tree endures so long as it is rooted and nourished but it can dry up and become tender for fire if not. And so we need to be careful uh, in our living that we, that we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and we draw from him the nourishment that we need so that we will persevere. Living for the short term, we will always be tempted by that low-hanging fruit from the enemy. Earthly riches, money, power, pleasure, control. What we need to be careful of is not to be bound by that earthbound thinking. Uh, but to keep our focus on God. Remember, what our, where our treasure is, our heart will be also. Where our heart is, that's where our treasure is. So, and when times are difficult, we can be even more tempted to reach for the low-hanging fruit, to numb our pain, to fill that void, or simply to be a distraction. Uh, these temporary pleasures, these short-term solutions will not help us to stand firm. Uh, and we will not win the long game. In fact, they will lead us further away from the abundant and eternal life that God has for all those who believe. So those oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, is a symbol of the perseverance of the saint. But it is also a symbol of the prevailing church. Because remember, Jesus came to establish his kingdom, which he is now carrying on through his church. We are kingdom bearers uh, as his church. And in Isaiah 61, verse 4, it says, They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall rise up the former, or the, raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastation of many generations. And this is the exciting thing. See, the kingdom of God is something that he planned in eternity past. And he, he brought its ultimate fulfillment through Jesus Christ, through his first coming and, and ultimately through his second coming. And we are partakers of that. You know, I'm a Christian educator. I work in a Christian school. Uh, that's just the way that God led me. And I love it because in a Christian school, I have the opportunity to every day be engaged in disciple making. You know, I want to disciple the next generation to stand firm. You know, the world around us, it just seems that Babylon is rising. And I just pray that God will raise up a generation of Daniels that will be able to live within this culture and engage in this culture prophetically, right? And, and to be able to show who Jesus is, even though it's so countercultural. You know, I have the opportunity in a school, right, to help my children, help my students and my teachers do, to help them understand that, that this is God's creation and that as we interact within it with other human beings, there's a way that God would have us to do that. I can openly introduce them to, to our loving Heavenly Father and to, uh, to Jesus Christ as their Savior so that they can have a restored relationship with God. I can help to guide them into moral and other uh, behaviors that will help them to nurture meaningful relationships with others based on the Word of God. And I can teach them that there's more to life than good grades, the right university, and a lucrative career. God has put us on this earth for his glory, however he may lead. And I have that wonderful opportunity. But you know, even if I wasn't a Christian educator, I'm a father of four children. And I'm a member of the body of Christ. And in the midst of these meaningful relationships, my life can impact others for eternity, and so can yours. You know, you and I have the privilege of playing a role in the continuation of God's kingdom through evangelism and through discipleship. So how will we choose to live? You know, uh, Eugene Peterson, in, in, uh, who I quoted earlier, wrote a book called A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. It's, for, it's about Psalm 121. And in that, he made the comparison between a pilgrim who is living their life, uh, living for the journey, 
uh, looking toward uh, the ultimate kingdom that they'll be a part of, a pilgrim that's moving toward the kingdom of heaven. And uh, they, he compared that to the tourist who has a very temporary mindset um, that looks to go to a place and just arrive there for a diversion. You know, and so what kind of a mindset are we going to have? Are we going to have a tourist mindset for the short-term gains and prosperity and personal well-being that we can, could be afforded to us in this life? Or are we going to be a pilgrim who's living with eternity in focus, investing in others so that they may come to the knowledge of God and that they may persevere and then pass this faith on to others? God has called us into a great, um, a great calling, right? to make his kingdom known to all generations until he comes. So the oak tree is a symbol of strength and endurance. It reminds us that through Christ we can personally endure and persevere and prevail if we hold firm to him, whether it be good times or difficult times. We need to allow his word to transform our thinking and his Holy Spirit to guide and empower us in our lives. The gospel itself endures when it is passed from one generation to the next so that God will have a witness throughout every generation and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The oak tree is a symbol of the perseverance of the saint. It is a symbol of the prevailing church and we can play an important part in that. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Lord. Uh, you know, you've called us for such a time as this, and it is a difficult time in the world. But God, you have made us to persevere. In fact, you preserve us. And I just want to pray, Lord God, today, Lord, there may be people watching that they need you, Lord. They have been trying to satisfy their lives with the low-hanging fruit. And today could be the day of salvation for them. And I just want to pray that you will draw them to yourself and show them from your word, God. Uh, and through your spirit, that you love them and that this kingdom that Jesus came to bring belongs to them if they will receive it by faith. And so, Lord, I just pray that you'll move the heart of the unbeliever toward faith today. And I want to pray for your saints, God, that you'll help us, God, um, not to be discouraged by, you know, the economic markets and, you know, and COVID-19 and just all of the distractions and all of the difficulties that we're currently facing. Lord, we have a, an everlasting hope and an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. And I just want to pray, Lord Jesus, that you will encourage your people to stand firm, to persevere, and to continue to do the work of the kingdom. Lord, that you might be glorified and that people will see and they too will be drawn to you and have the hope that we have as followers of Jesus Christ. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.